Well, uh, I will be talking about my uh, some work I have been doing in, during my PhD. My supervisor is Gustavo, and I, I don't know why, but he accept he accepted me and accept this <coughs> proposal I had for him <laughs> of of studying uh, music score. So I I, I don't know. How much you are trained in, in physics or mathematics? So I will be very simple. Uh, any detail we can discuss later. So I, I want to talk first about cell similarity and scale invariance. And the best uh, way to talk uh, about this is to see fractals because they are beautiful uh, and are, are very. Do I have a pointer here? Which. So some of some fractals are are built in a iterative way. You can see here, for example, uh, if in this triangle we draw inside the triangle another one, and then go and go on for each of uh, of those, we have this very peculiar geometric uh, figure. And the thing is that if you do a zoom in one of these triangles, you get the same. And if you again do a zoom and, and zoom in and zoom in, zoom in, you get the, the same uh, abstract of you. So th this is uh, something called self similarity. And there are some more fancy fractals, like this from Mandelbrot. And this is uh, broccoli, it's Romanesco, that it, it grows in this uh, uh, fractal way. I mean, it's not perfect because it's. it's Nature is not perfect. It's, it's, we are finite in some way. Uh, but this kind of behavior, no, not behavior, characteristic uh, uh, has been also identified in music scores. So for example, uh, this is from fractals. In this example, they identify a structure very similar to the Cantor set. Okay. So inspired by this kind of stuff, Ah, sorry. I, I will also say something about power laws. Power laws are <coughs> are writing in this way, and the good and the thing that that power laws share with 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 fractal, sorry, is uh, the scale invariance. This a type of self similarity. If you do a, a change in a scale you get something proportional to the original function. And in a linear plot, we can see power laws like this, but it's very difficult to identify them. So what we do is to plot in a logarithmic plot, and then we can see a, a, a line with a slope corresponding to the exponent, OK? Now, one of the first works in statistical physics about power laws in music was from uh, Boss and Clark. They found that uh, some audio files had this uh, had the power spectrum following a, a power law behavior. They claim that that this beta this is the, the power spectrum if, if it behaves as a power law, and this beta is very close to one for all cases they had. And they made a, an experiment where they conclude that this uh, um, power law behavior is the most pleasant. It exists because it's the most, most pleasant to human ear. So I will talk about later about this. But what I, what I want to tell you is the method I use to is something, it's, it's not the, uh, a Fourier transform, but it's uh, called uh, the trended fluctuation analysis. It was originally made for uh, analyzing DNA uh, sequences. So what, what we're doing with the fluctuation analysis is to study the random walk associated to the a time series. First, we integrate the, the time series to get this random walk. And then we divide the random walk into boxes of size equal size s. On each box, we adjust a polynomial. And then we estimate the root mean square function 
as this. And we change the size of S as our scale, for example, as we saw in the power loss. And then we, we made a, I'm sorry, we make a plot, log log, of how this function change with the size of S. And if we have a link uh, behavior, then we have a power law. And nice thing about this is that we can relate it to the power spectrum but via this relationship. And we have some information about the, the stochastic process or the noise behind the, the time series. OK? So if, if alpha is bigger than 0.5, is persistent correlations. And if alpha, if alpha gets higher, then our correlations are stronger. Uh, alpha equals uh, 0.5 is uncorrelated noise, is white noise. And this is very weird case, the trend of fluctuation analysis. But there are also, you can also detect anti-persistent correlations. Now, how do I, now you can expect that I, I see music scores as time series, right? <laughs> so how, how do I construct this time series? What I do is, actually I, I also use MIDIs, but the concept is this. I have a, a music score, and uh, I divide the music scores into time units. My time, my unit of time, uh, will be the the smallest uh, time value of the music score. In this case, you can see that it's an eight node. So, if I divide, for example, the first eight measures of this music score into eight nodes, we we have something like this. And then mapping these symbols to to its MIDI value, we can get something like this. Like it's a okay, it's a multivariate time series. <clears throat> now, why I wanted to do this because I, I wanted to do a, a statistical characterizations of different periods of time because I had this hypothesis. I don't know if you if you have experienced this because, I'm sorry, if you have experienced this, uh, but when I listen to contemporary music, not, not, not all of them, some pieces, sometimes I feel like I am listening to totally uncorrelated noise. I don't know if you, if you feel the same. <laughs> so my hypothesis was, well, this should be reflected in, in the alpha exponent, for example. So I selected these pieces, uh, from these composers, you can see that they are they are ordered in a chrono chronological way. Um, I selected them because they are famous, and also I like most of them. Beethoven, no, I don't like Beethoven. Um, and then what, what I expected is that is that that stuff. But when I did the the estimations, I mean, the, not the estimation, the calculation of the of the fluctuations function, I got different results that are not, some of them are not, uh, they don't behave as a power law. And I, first I, I didn't understand well this, but well, uh, what we decided to do is to try to characterize these kind of profiles, we named, we named them profiles. And what we found is that there are, there are a lot Profile similar to this that we have strong correlations here and then low correlations in the second in the second regime. We can say that there are two regimes here or two parts. Also, here in Sostakovich is weird because it is the opposite. It, it has lower correlations and stronger in in the in long range uh, structure. And we also have these very weird ones. We don't know what to, what to, what to, what to do with this. Um, we suppose that there are, uh, are more complicated. They maybe have more uh, different, uh, for example, this one, maybe this has one like this, another in this regime, another like this, but we, we, didn't, we didn't classify them. So what we do is to look at each of, <laughs> of the, uh, 
at, at each fluctuation we estimate. And we classify them by just uh, I uh, supervision, how do you say? I, I just, just by looking at them. Uh, we don't know machine learning or something like that, so we just did it ourselves. <laughs> and we found, we found these five different profiles. The, being the ideal, the ideal one, this ideal in, with quote. Uh, what is interesting, and I think is very nice, is that you can see that this profile, that is stronger correlations and lower, uh, very dominant for composers from. Uh, I mean, this is a uh, re Renaissance, Baroque, and early classical period, right? But this other one is more common for modern, uh, Osakovich, I think, modern composer. So this means that uh, in these ranges, in, in small, small range, in low range, the correlation is lower. So it, it can be more close to white noise, for example. So this is the case what I was talking about when I, I was talking about contemporary music, that it seems uncorrelated, but what we see is that at the end, they need to have a, a whole structure, okay? And this can be reflected in these ex examples I took to understand better what, what this uh, means. I had to look at, at, at the actual time series. And this is just a, an extract, also this one. But you can see that inside this size, I have a, I, I don't know if you see, but these are lines that in the ticks, there are lines. Mm, and they represent the size of the crossover, right? Of the, of the place we have the crossover. So you can see that in this case, for example, that the correlations are stronger at, at first. You can see that there's a lot of motifs of patterns, very similar patterns, that contribute to the correlations, to the low, low range correlations, okay? And in the case of Sostakovich, is, that is the opposite. It is very difficult to identify, pat identify patterns similar inside these, uh, these lines. But also you can see that the value of the long range correlations are quite similar. So the structure is very similar in the whole, but not in, 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 a small, in a small regions, okay? Yes, uh, uh, okay. So, <clears throat> this is interesting because we, uh, we can see, uh, uh, you will see in the next slide. Mm, I will talk up first about this one. Sorry, I didn't say, but this, this one is the, the cumulative distribution function of the unique scaling uh, um, type. So it's just a straight line. And we can see that Palestrina, it being the, the Renaissance composer, it is very constrained it's, and very correlated. And then, if you remember what I say, I say that as uh, times go by, the the rules of compositions are more flexible, and then maybe it can be more uncorrelated. So you can see that this tendency in this way for the other composers. But for Sostakovich, we have this comeback. And I have a, a hypothesis for this, is that uh, the pieces we analyzed from Sostakovich were, uh, were the 24 preludes and fugues. So there, the, the structure of the preludes and fugues is, is I mean, the, the, the structure of the fugues are more, are more uh, constrained because the fugue is a, a counterpoint, an imitative counterpoint. So you, you should have strong correlations in fugues. And you can see a plot of alpha two against alpha one. 
and <coughs> you can see also this this behavior that at a, the alpha is, is the first exponent, so you can see that this is more wide for all the composers, it's wider. And this is more constrained, meaning that this, the whole structure has not changed too much, but the, the, the structure in the, in the small patterns, or the rules, or harmonic rules, or harmony rules, have changed a lot. And maybe it's something similar to white noise, uh, where is it, maybe, it's, yes. Borjak is more the flexible, <laughs> uh, if, if, if I can say. Mm, the next is Sostakovich, and then you can see some, I mean, the number of pieces I took too big to make uh, strong conclusions, but what, what for me is, is very shocking is, uh, is this symmetry in Beethoven, for example, is it, it it is like a circle, uh, while the others, for example, Mozart is. It seems that that, that Mozart uh, like to play more with the with the small patterns. Oh, I I will not uh, finish. Okay, this is this is like theory of the first part is linear correlations. What I I want to talk is that. I don't. I don't need to convince that mus music is a complex system, a, a complex system, and we we know that one of the properties of complex systems is that uh, they have these nonlinear interrelationships. So we decided to look also for nonlinear correlations in the music scores. Uh, to do this, we use this uh, also developed by the, by the same group. Is the DFA both the of the magnitude series, magnitude series constructed by the interval series. And we built some surrogate data to validate these uh, calculations. This is the, the DFA. The DFA, the trend fluctuation analysis, detects only linear correlations. The trend fluctuation analysis of the magnitude, magnitude time series detect nonlinear correlations, is able to detect nonlinear correlations. We have 19 surrogates. In the blue shaded, shade, sorry, in the blue shaded area, uh, these surrogates are constructed by preserving the exact power spectrum of the original time series. So we are, we assure that we we have all the linear correlations in this surrogate. Uh, you can see that most of the of the of the compositions of music scores have these uh, nonlinear correlations and. And the nonlinear correlations varies in a very different way. We didn't we did we couldn't classify this. So what I, I want to talk this is just to finish is uh, <clears throat> in the first paper I told you about of Boss and Clark they made this experiment generating music or midis or something like that with one over f noise and one over f squared noise that is uh, uh, like Brownian noise is very correlated and uncorrelated noise. They found that the one over f was the most pleasant to to the people they they showed to. Okay, they made a survey, and what we decided to to interpret this to no sorry to interpret no interpret yeah I don't know how you say that. To give an interpretation to the results, we decided to <laughs> we decided to make a survey also. What we do, what we did is uh, to generate surrogates of two pieces, one from Bab and one from Beethoven, and we chose the pieces in the way that one should lack of nonlinear correlations. Okay, if the piece if the piece lack lacks from nonlinear correlations, it means that all the correlations, or almost all correlations, exist in the linear correlations, okay? And other one from Beethoven that has in all scale, in, in all scales, nonlinear correlations. So the survey was, we, we, we asked for six, age, years of musical training, and the most important part is to score from, from one to 10, how do they find the, 
the piece. And the, the results were quite uh, shocking, actually. <laughs> blue, blue ones are the original ones. You can see that people like original ones. Uh, maybe here they like more Bach, I think, than Beethoven, as I do. <laughs> And with the surrogate data, we got, I mean, we, we got the same result that, that people don't like too much surrogate data. But the big difference was here in, in the highly unpleasant is the, they didn't like surrogate from Beethoven, okay? These are some other results, I cannot tell, talk too much about it. But the main thing is that Somehow, these nonlinear correlations also add some um, regularity to the musical piece. We can we can uh, we can understand correlations as uh, repetitions that add regularity, as uh, and as Schwember said once that music is a balance between predictability predictability and surprise, so maybe regularity is related to predictability. And somehow these nonlinear correlations are, are uh, also regularity in musical piece. We don't know how, or I don't know, it's, it's, it's a very non-trivial ca uh, case, but they, they add like non-trivial structure. We cannot, until now, we cannot understand very well. But it seems that they are, they are important for the, they are important for the aesthetic perception, okay? And you can see the whole work here. We published the uh, Royal Society uh, last month. No, last month was February, uh, January, right? We published this on December, and you can, it's open access, so you can download, download, download it wherever you want. And it's everything, it's all. Thank you.